Hey everyone, this is Zephyr with the second part of our series on creating an adventure in Foundry VTT using the BathyWiki modular system. In this video, we're going to go over creating three scenes that are connected to our original town scene that are complete with terrain, foliage, prefabricated buildings, including a multi story building, sound design, NPCs, combat encounters, and quick encounters to deploy those NPCs and combat encounters when we're ready. We'll also go over some design considerations that we're keeping in mind while we're building out the town and planning out our adventure. First, we're going to return to our first scene, Afiota 01, where we created a scene for this simple multi-scene town in the last video. Here, we're going to take a look at our multi-level token teleports and take a look at Afiota 02 and 03, which we set up in the previous video so that we can build out the town in those scenes as well. Going back to one, we're gonna click on our drawing tool and open up the box that is configured for multi-level teleport. Here, my teleport identifier is Afiota-01-02. This is descriptive and unique. I'm going to copy this so that I can link this teleport zone with the teleport zone I'm about to create on Afiota 02. So I go to my new scene, open up my drawing tools, and draw a rectangle. When I finish drawing it, I'll double click on it and go to my multi level token tab. And in there, I will mark this as both an in and out teleport and paste in my teleport code. I'll also set it to activate via map note so it's not automatic. Going to my journals, I'm gonna select a journal that my players have visibility to. See, I have the permissions viewer module that shows this nice color code indicating that my players have observer permissions. I'm gonna set my text label for this stair journal that I dragged in to create a map note. I end up settling on to the mayor's block. I might change this later, but it's a good placeholder for now. I'm also going to change my icon from a book to village so that it matches the other notes in the town. Once that's done, it's time to start grabbing terrain. Going to my tile browser, then under modules, I'm going to Bailiwiki Maps Premium Towns. The Maps folder has all of the textures used in the module. If I go into Wilderness and Terrains, I have a lot of great options. I'm going to click on the Ocean and Sand folder, which has all of these dunes and spots. So I'm going to start placing these different dunes in position, similar to how we did in the previous video. You'll note that the asset grid size is specified as 100. You can think of this number as the DPI of the image. So if you increase that, that's telling Foundry that's a more detailed tile as opposed to a less detailed one. So increasing the number is going to make the tile that it drops in take up less space on your scene. This is a great way to get extra flexibility out of tiles, even though they might be designed to be a certain size. There is a limit to this. You can only make things so small before they look strange, or inversely, make them so large before they start to lose quality. So I'm going to place some of these dunes, experimenting a little bit with my asset size, and rotate them. Here, part of the reason why I'm orienting these dunes on the side here is because I want to restrict player movement in a believable way. I want to show that the town's edge kind of comes in on this left side of the map. In the bottom left corner of the scene, that's where they come in from the mayor's block. And so I want them to feel like they have to go up in this direction and there's not actually town to the left of this scene or to the north of the mayor's block. Now I'm gonna go back into that same folder in the terrains under wilderness, and I'm kind of debating on adding in extra pieces, but I'm ultimately gonna go back to the ocean and sand and use some ocean spots to create another little oasis like we did on that original scene. And again, if I play with my asset size, I can actually almost paint 
a different oasis here. And another great benefit of changing those asset sizes is that it makes the texture seem more varied than it actually is, letting you kind of add in some illusion of detail when there's not actually detail. Now I'm ready to start adding in some buildings. I really wanted to use Shafto's amazing bathhouse with the desert style roof here. So that's what I'm dropping in. I had previously imported this in the last video, but I ended up deciding I didn't want it on the first scene the players went into. So I'm positioning it here and gonna make great use of it in this scene. Then to get more buildings, I go into my compendiums and then we have the Bailiwiki Maps Town prefabs, which should be in my actors section. And you can see where I would have imported that bathhouse from. Now that I've added in this bathhouse, it's really big and uh, I really like it in this scene, but I need to adjust how I have my dunes so that it feels like they're not encroaching too much on the bathhouse and it feels natural that they come up to the edge there and that the bathhouse was constructed in a logical place. Another thing here is you'll notice that I have walls on the edge of the scene. This is because we duplicated it earlier on a pre-walled version. That's really important if you're using anything with levels. And it's also nice just to restrict player vision to only the scene itself. I'm going back into the town's prefabs compendium now, and I've searched for desert, and that will show me all of the desert buildings available in the prefabs. And I'm looking through here for something that I think makes sense to have near the bathhouse, and I ultimately decide on a home that I like. The first house I bring in is just way too large for here. And also I can go into my tiles tool and see that, see what the interior looks like without the roof showing. And I can also tell that this is a little too opulent for the town I want anyway, so I really don't want to use this one. One thing you'll notice as I'm going through this is that I spent a lot of time looking and choosing my prefabs. Once you actually know what prefabs you're going to be using, then things move a lot faster. Most of this is in the planning part, and that's where a lot of your time comes in. You'll notice, especially when we get to foliage and other things, where I've already selected all of the jungle pieces I want, and I have a good idea of their shapes, that I'll be able to move much more quickly. And that's where the system really shines. You can really reduce your prep time by knowing what the different prefab options are and getting familiar with them, because then you'll already know what brush or pen you want to paint with to create your scene. Now that I've selected this house, I'm going to rotate it and I decide that I want this to be on a 45 as opposed to uh, exactly lining up with the grid. So I'm going to do a little bit of testing just to make sure that the movement isn't too clunky. I found that usually you want to have walls, if they're not on a 90, you want them to be very close to a 90 or a 45. Otherwise, you can get kind of weird interactions where players have to move diagonally to get inside, and that's not always the most intuitive thing. If your players aren't aware, you can move with the arrow keys, or WASD, and if you click both, say, the up and left arrows, you will move diagonally one square up and to the left. And I'm not positive if Foundry calculates this as a instance of two separate movements, or if it is one movement as far as movement speed is concerned, but I do know that it will let you bypass some walls that are at an angle. Now that I've got my buildings in here, I'm gonna go back into my wilderness and you'll see I have all of the jungle plants imported that I used on the previous scene. And again, we're gonna just place them around and rotate and kind of create this nice border on the left side and the upper side of the scene, rather east and north sides. Because again, I want it to feel like the jungle wraps around that part of the town so they don't have to build that out. Unless I experiment a bit with these different shapes and I'm kind of remembering where everything is. I'm coming back to building this a few days after that first scene. And so I don't remember exactly what all of the shapes are and corresponding with the numbers. You also notice that I place some of these prefabs on a half grid as opposed to the full grid. How I'm able to do that is just while I'm positioning the control token, I'm holding down the shift key and that lets me bypass snap to grid. And that's a really good trick for 
both varying the appearance of the different prefabs and also positioning things just the way you like it to frame things out. I use that really heavily in this when I am framing out paths. I am deciding that I need a few more bits of foliage in here that I hadn't completely imported. And I'm just double checking in my actors directory that I don't have any of these already imported. If I already have, say, Jungle Growth 02 imported, and I drag Jungle Growth 02 out from the compendium, it'll import a second version of that actor, which clutters up my actors directory and can eventually kind of slow down the performance of my Foundry server. So it's very important if you are bringing in lots of prefabs that are of a similar type, just make sure that you're working with your actors directory open and the compendium open, so you're not bringing in duplicates. It's not the end of the world if you do bring in duplicates, especially for these prefabs, but again, it can cause some performance issues if you have too many actors in, particularly ones as complicated as prefabs. Related to the actors issue with having too many large and complex actors imported, causing some slowdowns, that's also a reason why when we're completely done with this adventure, we're actually going to delete the folders in our actors directory that have all of the prefabs that we used. You want to try and keep your actors directory and scenes directories as small as possible. Otherwise, your files that hold all the information for that in your installation can get really large and get kind of bloated. And both the server and clients can index those to an extent, and that can cause some issues. It's not something that's going to cause catastrophic instability, but it could reduce the performance and you need every bit of performance you can if you're working with players that don't have really high-end machines or you don't have a high-end machine yourself. Here, I wanna block off the back corner of the uh, bathhouse and imply that it butts up to the jungle as well. So I'm using the token attacher quick edit macro that we imported in the previous video. And I'm using that to kind of tweak my walls on these prefabs so that they meet up with the corner of the bathhouse. That way players can't get past the bathhouse and see that it's kind of weirdly empty there. I'm checking some other spots to see if I want to tweak walls there as well, but ultimately decide that I'm good to go with this. Now I'm going to go in and add those paths. So I'm going back to my tile browser and under user data in modules, I go to the beta wiki maps for your towns again. Maps, again, that's where all the tiles and textures are. This time I'm going to the town square and it's in the MISC2 folder. There's a subfolder for paths and roads. Like I mentioned in the previous video, I really want this to have the feel of like trodden dirt and everything and not so much cobble or industry, I suppose. This is very much a beach island and there's not a lot of stone to be quarried here. We'll get to some rocks and such later in the video and in the subsequent parts of this adventure series, but I really don't want it to seem like they have a lot of rocks or particularly care to bring in stone for much other than building. Additionally, if you think about it, this is a pretty small island. We'll eventually be reaching all three major edges of the island with this. And if it's fairly small, then there's probably not much use in having carts and horses which would be the main reason why you would want uh, cobbled roads is to facilitate travel via uh, carts and animals. As I'm laying out the pads, you'll notice that I really heavily use the rotations and adjusting my asset grid size to kind of fill in shapes and blobs. I do want to keep the main pieces the same asset grid size or the same DPI, that way the path has a fairly consistent width, but if there's any of these weird junctions, I am definitely not afraid to tweak the size or rotate things weirdly. A particular path that I like to use a lot is this second from the left in the top row. It's this nice, weird, slightly curved triangular piece. It's great. And it really helps for filling in gaps. Another trick is if you want to mirror a tile, you can double click on it to open up the tile configuration and you'll notice that there's the height and width in pixels. You can manually set that. It's kind of a way of overriding the asset grid size. But a great trick with that is rather than setting it to a positive number, you can set the width or the height to a negative number 
and then you will essentially flip that tile off of that axis. Do note that if you've rotated the tile at all, then that is going to have some strange results because it's going to respect the original orientation of the tile when you first dragged it in, not the new one that you've rotated. So it's probably best to flip before you place it, or at least be prepared to make some adjustments afterwards. Another trick is with the asset grid size, you can also make those asset grid numbers smaller than they actually are to enlarge your tiles. Now that I'm all happy with my roads, I'm gonna move on to my next scene. I have decided that I actually want to make a fourth scene here. So I'm just gonna duplicate that Afiota 03 and make an Afiota 04 that's connected to this one. And I'm going to leave my grid size and everything. You'll notice the grid size is 100 and my width and height is 2720. That's gonna be 27 by 27 grid units. Something here, I want to change my unrestricted vision range. That was something we fixed in the last video. And I want that so that my players can see everywhere, but I want that to be on a threshold so that when it's dark, they can't see to the edge of the scene. Now I'm going to go into my drawing tool and set up another multi-level token drawing. And again, we're going to go into the multi-level tab, make it in, out, and I'm going to follow the same naming scheme and make this Afiota 02-04. And again, set it to activate via map note. That way it's not automatic and my players understand what's going to happen when they get over there. Dragging in that same stair entry and naming it something new. Let's say the Northwest Edge. Because this is going to be the final scene on this side of the town. And make it a village icon again to keep in theme. Once I've got that all set up, I'm going to finish off this oasis here. Use my drawing tool and draw a polygon. This is the best way to handle multi-level token zones for calling macros around organic shapes like this body of water. And notice that I'm not following this exactly, I'm getting it close. You don't really need to have these really complex drawings to perfectly match the coastline here or go off into the padded area. In multi-level token tab this time, we're gonna scroll all the way down to macro triggers. And I'm going to use the water walking macro. So I'm setting, setting this to activate on enter, leave, and movement. They need to put in the macro name. If I hadn't already imported this, I could find the macro in my macro compendiums under the Bailiwiki maps town macros. Then water walking is under the making stuff work section. I already have it imported, and you can see that here in my macro folder. It's water, it's walking water, excuse me. I'm gonna go ahead and copy that name instead of typing it out manually. Just less room for error there. And I paste it in and accept. Since I did a lot of testing in the previous video, I've cut that out here and just run through it really quickly myself. Now that we've built one scene together, I'm going to kind of run through these next two pretty quickly. Here I'm setting up the Afiota 04 scene, and this has the teleport to the north side. That's kind of where I'm calling the bathhouse area. And I'm going to build out this final scene on the edge of the town in the northwest. I've already had a session with my players kind of getting them to this town. They had just been on the beach and they got to the mayor's block and got a quest. And in that, I decided that I'm going to have them go to a cave by the ocean that's kind of carved out by the waves hitting the beach. And in that cave, there's going to be a sea hag and a water weird. So what I'm doing here is I want them to travel through the northwest side of town and then later, I want to keep them coming back to this part just to keep things continual and be able to set things up on the opposite end of town that will have a nice flow to it. So I really want to have this side have a trail that kind of filters off towards the beach. Or rather, this isn't quite a beach that I'm going to have, but a more rocky shore that will have, you know, pounding waves and everything. I also decided that I want to put an inn here. I'm gonna have this town have the docks on the opposite side. And what I want to do is I wanna use those pirate attacks that we've already started placing and 
set those up so that in the middle of the night, the players are sleeping at the inn and awaken to the sounds of cannon and screams as a pirate ship sails up and begins to assault the town. I think it's a lot more interesting if they see the pirates coming from the docks and starting to attack the town and they have to fight their way to the ship to beat the captain. So I'm structuring this in a very linear setup on the town to channel my players where I want them to go. As I'm building this, you'll also notice that I've done some other tricks. You can change the token image size on these prefabs to adjust the size of the entire prefab. And you'll see me change some to 0.5 or 0.7 to scale down the tiles and walls. Another important thing I'm doing here that we kind of brushed over in the last episode is I'm using Token Attacher Quick Edit Mode to move all of these control tokens out into the padded area of the scene. This is really helpful for when I'm creating quick encounters later, so don't accidentally lasso in one of the prefabs. And also when I'm running combat or an encounter with my players, then I don't accidentally throw a control token into the initiative tracker. And again, now that I'm wrapping up this scene, I'm doing kind of this broken path, indicating that this isn't really a direction that people in the town go to very frequently, which would explain why there's this issue with this sea hag that people in the town aren't necessarily already dealing with. Part of my technique here is if I want this to kind of go to a more rocky shore, Again, not really suitable for like coring stone, but just pulverized rock and everything. Uh, I'm going to use a little bit of these rocky bits in the paths. And you'll notice me again adjusting my different sizes and widths and heights on these paths to kind of smush them or mirror them. I'm also going to add in a little bit of cracked earth to break things up in this area, just because I don't have as many buildings in this negative space. I also decided that I want to go back and grab some rocks out of the regular wilderness. Again, this is going to kind of play into this rocky beach in a bit. I'm not quite ready to design my beach, so I went ahead and made the drawing a red tint. And I'll show that a little bit more later. And here, I'm going back over my scene configuration. Again, I wanted to have the unrestricted vision range checked so that my players can see to the edge of the map during the day, but I'm also setting a limitation threshold on that so that if it gets above 0.8 darkness, they can't see all the way over unless they have illumination or they have like dark vision of 120 feet or something like that. And I'm going through and making sure that all of my scenes match this behavior. I think 0.8 is a good level here because to me that's it's not quite pitch black yet, but it's dark enough that things start to get fuzzy as you look out. Now I'm gonna move on to my third and final scene for today, and I'm making kind of a market area. This is gonna be the area near the docks where there are people set up with different market stalls to sell goods and a little bit of just congregating. When I create my multi-level token zone here for the docks, I end up deciding on using an anchor for it, just to differentiate it a little bit from the town. But I'm not completely sold on whether I want the anchor. And if you see all these different entry icons you can pick, it's hard to know exactly what they look like as you're browsing through that. And I'm going to actually double check those to make sure the anchor is what I want. If I go into my tile browser and I select, instead of under user data, core data, that gets me into the foundry folders. Under icons and SVG, you can see all of the different options for those icons. If you hover over them, it will tell you the name. So when you see that down arrow or the masked man, that's where these icons are coming from. It's calling from this SVG folder. After going through it, I decide that the anchor is what I want for now but I do ultimately end up changing it to the village as it is still a part of the town. With my multi-level token zone kind of set up, I'm now going to go ahead and build out this scene. 
And like I said, I want this to be kind of a marketplace area. So I'm going into the town prefabs and under the market subfolder, I'm picking out a few different things that I like. I don't really want this place to have the feel of a major blacksmith that does arms and armor. I want this to feel very much like a newbie town or a tourist destination as opposed to a large city that has a lot of preparation. So I use the mining supplies as kind of a substitute for a more general blacksmith. In a lot of medieval towns, the blacksmith wouldn't necessarily be making arms and armor, but would be making things like tools, nails, and uh, rings for barrels, etc. And that's kind of what I wanted to convey here. As I play around quite a bit with the placements of different stalls. And I want to kind of have a almost alley feel to it on this one side down here by the candle maker's shop. Just playing around with how you have things oriented can really inform how your players will use the space and really give you a lot of control. If you want players to explore a certain area, add paths to it and add different prefabs or custom pieces that you make to direct the flow of traffic in one direction. It's kind of the same idea that I've been using with the foliage and such on the sides to convey the size of the town or the boundaries of the town, but writ large here. This time I am going back into the paths and roads and I am going to use some of the cobble. This is a little bit more of the developed area and there's a little bit more going on. You'll notice that when I first bring it in, the tile seems to be almost over my prefabs. So I go ahead and drop that to the background and you'll see that it kind of fights with me a little bit, the tile browser on this scene. And I do have to drop things to the back a lot. I am going to reduce the cleanliness of the cobble area by having a lot of the dirt paths overlap it. You also see me looking through some different pieces in the town square folder in the maps and looking to see if there's any extra textures I can add to one of these stalls to be happier with it. But I ultimately decide that it just didn't fit and didn't work for me. So I'm making another stall. Another pro tip is if you need to reposition something and you don't like where the token attacher control token is, you can reposition it in relation to the rest of the prefab with quick edit mode and then grab it again and go from there. And we're using those same techniques that we already did with changing asset grid size, manually changing things in the tile browser or the tile configuration window rather that allow us to mirror things or squish things out. I'm going to use more of the cobbled bits to give the market a more permanent feel, but still dropping those to the lowest level possible so that the more dirty paths and everything go over the top because I want it to seem like it is a less, that it is a less official thing. And here you can see me messing with the tiles some more to kind of give a squished look to something. Again, another great way to get more mileage out of terrain spots and tiles than their kind of stock application. Another thing you'll notice is I didn't start with any extra terrain features, unlike usual. Usually I do terrain tiles first, like those dunes, and then I put in my prefabs, then I go back with my foliage. On this particular scene, I knew that I was going to do a lot of smaller stalls and such, and I wasn't quite sure how I wanted the space to flow yet. I knew that I wanted players to enter from the top right, from the mayor's block, but I wasn't exactly sure if I would end up wanting the docks to be on this lower left side. And I didn't know exactly how I wanted the jungle to kind of conform to this space, so I decided to put in the buildings first. There's absolutely nothing wrong with either direction. As I'm getting happy with my paths and everything, I am going to go ahead and add in some of the foliage, but I'm going to look at some of the tactical and decor options to see if there's anything I like in there to fill in the space a little bit more. I ultimately decide that I'm not going to use that, but it was good to take a look anyway. 
And here's where I'm going to actually start framing things in with the dunes and giving that sense that this is kind of the only area where the town comes out. At. An alternative to having such small points of entry here is you could expand it so that one entire side of your new scene connects back to the adjacent town tile. But I wanted this to feel a little windy and like the jungle is a part of the town in some respects. I'm gonna go through and frame everything out and add in all of that foliage. Here, I wanna make particular note of where these doors are in the back of this diviner and apothecary shop. I don't want these doors to just go nowhere. I want them to still be viable entrance points and exit points, even if they're a little bit more like the actual back door rather than an alternative main entrance or just a useless door. When I'm happy with all of my framing, I'm gonna start adding in some more clutter type vegetation here. And I use that trick again with holding down shift to position a control token exactly where I want it. And with the whole scene ready to go, I go ahead and move all of my control tokens off, again with quick edit mode up, so I'm not dragging the prefabs off. I'm also going to go ahead and select all my tokens with Control A and make them all hidden. For the multi level token zone to the docks, I'm not quite ready to do the dock scene yet. So I'm going into the fill settings and making this a solid fill and leaving it red. This is my little way of reminding myself to go back and finish that. With everything else done, I think it's time to start adding in some NPCs. I'm going to use the same generic NPCs that I built out in the previous episode. And I do have token mold on just to see the different names. Those won't be saved when we make a quick encounter, but it just feels nice to have unique names as I'm dropping things in. I use this only for generic NPCs, like ones where a player would ask like, oh, what's the bartender's name? But I don't have a plan for the bartender in my story per se. It's just nice to have those automatic generators so you don't have to sit there and twiddle your thumbs as you try to come up with something or type into another name generator or just say Steve for the 12th time that session. It's just a nice way to get around some of those uh, sticky situations. You'll notice that I also go through and take the time to rotate all of these the way I want as Quick Encounters will maintain the rotation of the tokens you select, as well as their position. So I want these to be situated just like I like it. When I'm done, I'm gonna make a Quick Encounter by selecting all of my tokens here using a drag box. I don't wanna use Control A here, because then I'll get my control tokens. Then in the Tokens tools, there's a fist icon for Quick Encounters, and that'll create my Quick Encounter. You can review all of the actors in it to make sure no buildings are caught in it, and I'm going to rename my Quick Encounter. Here, I just want this to be Market NPCs. Something descriptive, easy to remember, and I want to add a little bit of description to the scene. So again, this is the generic NPCs for this market, and I want to describe kind of what's going on. Vendors at all of the stalls and within the buildings and some customers milling about. This is also where I would make a note to myself about any particular behaviors, such as the home being empty during the day. When I've got everything the way I like, I save the entry and cancel the quick encounter because I don't want to run it or change anything. I also like to go into my journals, uh, map notes tab rather, and double click on this map note and change its color to green. You can click on the bar and just pick a new color or alter the RGB values, or put in a hex if you know. As I've updated that, I just move it into the middle so it's nice and accessible for me and I know what's going on there. I'm also gonna go into my journals directory and drag the quick encounter into the appropriate folder I have set up. And I decided to make a subfolder for combats just to keep things straight. Speaking of combat encounters, I think it's time for me to set up the pirate attack for this part of the town. I'm going to speed things up for this part, though. 
I'm going to go ahead and use the bandits and bandit captains that I imported for the previous video. Again, they've got a piratey feel to them already, and if it's not broke, don't fix it. And I'm going to make another quick encounter, again, this time being descriptive with it, describing that it's a pirate attack and they're trying to assault the marketplace customers and ransack the shops. Just something easy that I'm going to remember and give myself context when I'm running it in the session. I also like to keep my notes in places that are easy for me to see, but not in my way. Then I'm going to repeat this process on the other scenes. I like to do NPCs first, and then do the combat encounters. Placing down all of my nice, unique little NPCs. And don't limit yourself to just these generic NPCs that I've created. We're going to come back and add some specific ones that have set names and stat blocks and quests pointers or triggers for our party in a subsequent part, but this is just kind of the extra folks that are around to add fluff and life to the town, so it doesn't feel like the only people in town are quest givers. I also really like how quick encounters can help me tell a story with my combat encounters by controlling the position. You can have the pirates right here banging on the door as opposed to dragging them in one by one in a session. And again, it's really good and helpful to have nice little descriptions on your quick encounters to remind yourself when you're running the session. Whenever you run a quick encounter, that general note's going to come up and tell you all the information you need about that scene. When I get to the inside, I've decided that I actually want to use the tavern from the docks on this scene. I like that it's another multi-story building. It's going to be big and complex, and it's going to really make sense as to why the players are way out here at this inn. And if it's a kind of a touristy town, then it should have a large tavern. Notice that it doesn't quite fit the rest of the town since it's a lot more stone heavy and looks more like something you would find in the city, or at the very least, a larger town that has a more developed docks region. I'm going to come back to this in the next video and create a more deserty feel for this and just replace the tiles. So that'll be in the next video, but for now I'm going to get it into position because I do want to have an idea for the space. You'll notice that I keep getting errors from Chrome that Foundry has stopped working or the page is unresponsive. This is because when you're moving really large prefabs like this, it takes up a lot of memory. In these situations, it's important to be patient and wait for the page to respond. The large prefabs aren't going to be nearly as snappy as the small ones that are just foliage or something like that. So just be patient and position things carefully. And once you have these large prefabs set up, don't move them again. Since I'm using a multi-level prefab here, it's important to set up my levels for the scene. So go into your levels tool, then at the very top, just underneath that, there's a pencil where you edit levels. You can get levels from the scene. Here there's a lot of weird values because of the foliage. So I'm going to cancel and edit the levels and do generate suggested levels. And I'm really fine with this, having these ranges from every 10 feet. That's how a lot of these multi-story prefabs are structured. It's just the foliage that was kind of wonky. If I click on the top button, that toggles the UI, which lets me scroll through each of the floors. One thing to note here is these levels aren't going to give you a true reckoning of what tokens are going to see when they're navigating the scene. So don't stress too much if things like those beds are visible while you're a GM. They won't be when you're running through with a token. And you hopefully saw that at the beginning of the video in the intro when I was running around. Obviously, making a change into such a large prefab is going to be quite different from having that smaller in here. So I have to make a lot of adjustments. You noticed me deleting all of the foliage prefabs that were in this space that's now occupied by the in. And I'm just going to go in and make some tweaks, make sure there's enough space here so it doesn't feel like this in is about to step on this house and cobbler shop, and re-add some dunes in. Another good note about the dunes is you'll notice that I've kept the orientation of the shadows pretty consistent. 
there's always light on the left side and dark on the right side. And while this isn't crucial, I do think it helps make things feel right when your players are going through or when you're looking at these maps again, that the shadows are oriented in a similar direction. This isn't always possible, but it's really helpful when you can do it. And I'm now going to add in my NPCs and quick encounters for this scene. It's a little tricky adding in actors on this scene because of how all of the tiles stack up when I'm in GM mode, but that's okay. It takes a little bit of getting used to, but once you have the hang of it, it moves pretty quickly. Another great thing about quick encounters is that it will maintain elevations. If you've used the Gothic castle scenes and gone into the Belfry, for example, there are the spiders that are in the Belfry that actually appear on an upper level instead of the ground floor level of the belfry. So I can use that same technique here and maintain my elevation. And you can manually adjust height to force tokens up to the floor you want. I'm dragging a few people into position and getting happy with all my NPCs. Just like on those previous scenes, when I'm happy with my NPCs, I'm going to go ahead and drag select them all into the same quick encounter. I did miss a couple of control tokens, so I want to make sure those are all good before I set up the quick encounter. And once more, we're just making sure things are nice and descriptive for ourselves. Whatever will help us when we're actually running the session is what we should put in these notes. With the last of my quick encounters taken care of, I'm going to take care of this basement in the inn. I'm going to go into my tile browser, modules, beta wiki maps, premium towns, maps, basements, and look for a trap door. This is that same technique we went over in the previous video for if you didn't want to add a modular basement to a prefab. I don't really anticipate my players spending a ton of time in the inn, so I'm going to just cover up the basement here. Ideally, I have quests and everything keeping them occupied until it's time for them to take a long rest, and they're going to go straight to bed. And again, I can raise the tile up to make sure it covers this prefab. So I do that here to make sure the same position. And I'm going to tweak the width and height a little bit to make sure it covers up completely and looks more natural here, as opposed to being a bit out of place with the edges of that brickwork being exposed. And holding down shift lets me position it pretty precisely and get the look I want. And with that, the inn is taken care of, and my quick encounters for the scene are all set up. And we are on the home stretch of the multi scene town. The next phase is going to be sound design. So I go into my sound tool and draw a local sound. And under Modules, Premium Towns, there's a Sounds folder. And I already know the sounds I want. I'm going to use those Distant Ocean Waves that we used previously. And I'm going to drop them in on this scene to indicate that it's getting close to that rocky shore I mentioned earlier. And if you click on these earmuffs kind of things, or headphones, then you can preview ambient sounds and hover your mouse around the sound area to see how the tapering works and how loud it is to determine if you're happy with it or not. You'll see me doing this as I'm figuring out exactly how far out I want the sound to be and how loud. It's also a great way to really quickly cycle through a variety of different sounds to pick out your favorite. With my sound all picked out, you'll notice that with the sound tool open, this circle has a lot of holes in it. And just like we had to do in the previous video, we have to adjust these wall settings. By default, every wall type in Foundry obstructs sounds normally. So I'm going through and I'm changing all of these walls with quick edit mode to not block sound. You'll notice that I don't actually select all of them at once. If you're editing multiple walls at once, then you will push the same settings to all of them. So you can lose the invisible settings or regular settings and turn them into terrain walls all of height infinity to 15. And I don't want that. So I'm doing them in groups. 
it's kind of tedious, but that's the price I pay here for being meticulous. After I'm happy with my sounds and walls on the inscene, I'm going to go back to that marketplace and add in the medieval town loop sound there. It's got the peeling of a blacksmith's hammer that I really enjoy, and I think it just fits the space well. After I've added that in, I'm again going to go through and adjust my walls to make sure that sound can pass as I would like it to. And with that, our little multi-scene town is complete. In the next video, we're going to go in with the dungeon draft file to the docks tavern that we used as a multi-story prefab, and we're going to make a more desert or oasis themed version of that using some different techniques in dungeon draft, and then bring those over to Foundry to update our own personal instance of that prefab and save it for later. After that's taken care of, we're going to make some custom ships in Dungeon Draft that we will use to populate our docks and build out that scene. With our custom art added, then we'll wrap up the pirate encounter by adding in a ship that's going to attack and some destructive elements for the town to deal with for our players. Finally, we're going to add in the path that goes to the northwest corner of the island to fight that sea hag and water weird before the players have to deal with the pirates. This has been Zephyr. Thank you so much for watching. I hope that this has shown you the power of the BaileyWiki modular system, and I hope you'll join me for the next few videos in the series. Thanks so much, and have a great day.